Thank you very much for being here. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerini Marimo. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight for what is an unusual event for us, because as you know, it's not typically Italian. We're not talking about Italians, but there is a connection. And as I always say, our concept of what is Italian is very ecumenical, it's very open. So at least two of the protagonists of the b wonderful book that Chris Whipple wrote are Italian-American, uh, Leon Panetta and John Podesta. And I was uh, reminding in my little uh, preface to the invitation that when Bill Clinton uh, announced that uh, Leon Panetta would be his chief of staff, he said, I picked him because he's the only one who can read Machiavelli in the original. <laughs> and I love that because teaching Machiavelli here at New York University, I'm always desperate to recruit students and I thought that that was a great tagline to promote my course. <laughs> and indeed it was. So uh, the other reason why I'm very happy is that uh, the idea of uh, this presentation was born at a wonderful dinner that uh, my friend Angela Vitaliano cooked for us. It was like being right in Naples, even if we were on the Upper West Side, where I met uh, uh, Carla and his wife, Carrie. And uh, he was talking about the book. He was in the process of, I think, of finishing it, of giving the last touches. So I thought we should have it at the Casa, even if it's not directly Italian. And I'm very happy we did. Um, and of course, I had no other choice but inviting Angela to discuss and, in, and enter in a conversation um, with Chris Whipple about his book. Angela, for those of you who don't know her, is um, a journalist. She writes for the Huffington Post uh, and for many other publications. She's a very, very followed uh, influencer, one would say, on the, on the internet. And I invite you to follow her, her Facebook page and her blog and her take on New York and her experience in New York and what New York meant in her life is really something that we should all read um, for enriching ourselves from a human and cultural point of view. Uh, the other reason I invited Angela to be here tonight is that the previous time she was on this stage, she was chairing an event with about a dozen women, right? And as of now, that's the event that had more clicks, the registration, the recording of this event, of our history. I think it's about 20,000 people who watched it. So she brings good luck. <laughs> and to me, that's another good reason. So without further ado, I would like to ask you to welcome very warmly Chris Whipple and Angela Vitaliano. Thank you. We are here. Great to be here. Great to be here for me. Thank you, Stefano. Uh, I am crying inside because I find out uh, last Saturday with the royal wedding that is not nice to cry in public. So I'm not crying. <laughs> also, thank you to everybody. Sorry for my uh, accent. I mean, it's very exotic. But uh, thank you to all the friends that are here without making pizza. So you are here, and I did have to make pizza. You are just here because Chris. Thank <coughs> you, Chris, for being here. I was told here. there was pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our joke. We can say that. Because Chris is almost every day uh, uh, invited as guest at CNN or MSNBC, but especially CNN from uh, one of my favorite, favorite guy, that is Don Lemon, and uh, second, Anderson Cooper. So in honor of Don Lemon, I'm doing this, <laughs> and I am ready. And every time I say, Chris, can I bring you guys pizza, please? And one time I will do. I will arrive with a pizza or lasagna. <laughs> But let's be <coughs> serious. So there is a lot of Italy in this book that First and foremost, you have to buy, you have to read, you have to reread. This is the second time I read because it's amazing. And I'm not saying because it's here, but just because you learn a lot and it's a lot of work. But there is also a lot of Italy, as uh, Stefano said, uh, and there is a lot of Italy that also tells a story from where we went 
to today, because we went from Leon Panetta and uh, John Podesta to Anthony Scaramucci to Rudy Giuliani. <coughs> so I don't know, I'm not saying anything, no comment, <laughs> but we will see that. So the first question, though, is you took five years to write this book, not to write, but to do all the research. Yeah. And uh, it was a lot of work because he interviewed too many people, 18, I think, chief of staff, two presidents, and uh, many, many people, so a lot. And there was a lot of fact checking, so there is no fake news in this book. And uh, so did you ever thought that when your book was coming out on April 19, uh, 2017, <coughs> we were going to have Donald Trump as a president? And did you think that? Uh, Richard Nixon kind of made a grin of revenge when the book came out and <laughs> Trump was the president? A grin of revenge? Yes, like, I, ha, I am not the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm no longer the most corrupt president yeah, in American history, like maybe. Um, <clears throat> I did not see it coming. I had no idea. In fact, I finished the book right before the election. And after the election, wrote a very hasty epilogue in which I tried to predict what Donald Trump would have to do um, in order to govern, uh, what, what sort of chief of staff he would need. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't clairvoyant about this, but you didn't have to be a genius to predict that Trump would be utterly unable to govern. So someone, someone with no governing experience whatsoever, among other liabilities. Um, so I predicted that if, if Trump failed to choose a White House chief of staff who was uh, competent, and if he failed to empower that White House chief of staff to do the job that had to be done, that he would be completely unable to govern. And um, I'm afraid that was true. So that you saw coming. You know, you saw coming that, you know, it was going to be, as you say sometimes, at some point, the messy uh, presidency that we are having. But um, let's, we, we don't have Stefano, uh, something like this in Italy. We don't have a chief of staff. Or then you, you will tell us if we have something like that. Because I'm curious. I am too young to remember if we are. <coughs> but I, I read it just because, you know, I am very young, but English is not my first language, as you can think. You think well. So uh, let's go. The, 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 the book is about chief of staff, chief of staff. And uh, the chief of staff is, uh, to quote, uh, in an Italian-American former chief of staff who loved Machiavelli, uh, Leon Panetta, he said, you have to be the person, talking about chief of staff, you have to be the person that says no. You have to got to be the son of a bitch who basically tells somebody what the president can tell him. So when I read this, I thought, especially for the son of a bitch thing, I want to be a chief of staff because <laughs> it might be fantastic to be always the one says no, okay? <laughs> and. Chris is saying another point that there are only two answers for the president. Yes, oh yes, sir. Imagine to be a chief of staff and say no. So I wanted to be that. But tell us, why Eisenhower, Eisenhower thought about yeah. the chief of staff and who is the chief of staff? Well, you know, there's nothing in the Constitution about a White House chief. Um, you know, he's hired and fired by the president alone, unelected, unconfirmed. And it's really a modern creation. Eisenhower, uh, who had obviously been in the army, wanted to, wanted to create a civilian version of his army chief of staff, which he, which he did by hiring this guy named Sherman Adams, who was a gruff, tough, monosyllabic character. And they called him <coughs> the abominable no man. Uh, <laughs> he was a great gatekeeper, uh, and he you know, he there was a there was actually a joke about uh, back in those days um, that uh, people would say, "Well, what happens if um, if what would happen if Eisenhower died and Nixon became president?" <laughs> and someone said, "What happens if Sherman Adams dies and Eisenhower becomes president?" <laughs> <clears throat> so you know, the White House chief from that day forward has been 
sometimes, uh, in, 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 in some people's opinion, more powerful than the president. Um, but the thing that is true really since Richard Nixon, in my opinion, is that every president learns often the hard way that you cannot govern effectively without an empowered White House chief of staff who can execute your agenda and, again, as you said, most importantly, tell the president what he does not want to hear. That's the most critical part of the job, and it's the part of the job, unfortunately, that John Kelly has utterly failed uh, to carry out, in my opinion. When uh, John Kelly, I go to the one of the last question. When John Kelly uh, received, you know, <coughs> was called by Trump, I read in your book, and he called his old friend again, Leon Panetta, to get some advice. And Panetta say, why are you were taking this job? Something like that. You know, you, you, it's, <coughs> it's crazy. I the am first thing he quoting. said was, go out and get go a big and get bottle <laughs> of scotch. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it was clear. And so I am asking you what Panetta asked. Kelly, why did I accept? Why is still there? And how long is going to be there? Well, you know, it, Kelly, the danger here is uh, trying to play amateur a psychoanalyst, which, which I don't want to do. But Kelly has been kind of revealing about this, I think. He, he's, he said that he didn't have a choice. I mean, he was, of course he had a choice. He was head of the Department of Homeland Security. He didn't have to accept Trump's uh, request that he become chief of staff. But I think Kelly, to some extent, is he's a stubborn Marine. He's duty, honor, country. Uh, the tough part of that equation with this president is the honor part. Um, <clears throat> and I think, to some extent, it may be that four-star generals are accustomed to saluting the commander in chief rather than telling him what he needs to know. And so I think that this is like a bad marriage, Trump and Kelly. I think both parties have decided to try to muddle through. And I think Kelly, just because of the way he is, may not, may not quit uh, unless Trump fires him. And I think Trump, for now, wants to just muddle through. I, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times a couple of weeks ago in which um, when, when Trump was talking about trying to govern without a White House chief, and I said the only thing worse than a White House with a flawed chief of staff is a White House with no chief of staff for a lot of reasons we can talk about. And the no chief of staff <coughs> decision was one of uh, the one that affected the Jimmy, Jimmy Carter presidency for a yeah. while. Yeah. Why the, the president that is, by definition, uh, the most intelligent president of the 20th century decided to go without a chief of staff <coughs> for quite yeah. a while, and then uh, why did he decide to, you know, to give in? Yeah, no, that's the great irony. Jimmy Carter is arguably the most intelligent president of the 20th century. He was trained as a nuclear engineer. He could absorb tremendous amounts of, of information and distill it into policy. He was a br brilliant, is a brilliant guy. Um, but he did not, you know, Ronald Reagan, who was not such a brilliant guy, intuited something that Jimmy Carter never understood, which is that uh, an outsider president needs a consummate insider as White House chief to help you get things done. You need somebody who knows Capitol Hill. You need somebody who knows how the White House runs. At the end of the day, you have to have somebody who will execute your agenda. And it, it, things don't just happen. I mean, uh, Harry Truman famously said about Dwight Eisenhower when he was elected, he said, poor Ike. He said, he's going to get in there, he's going to snap his fingers and say, do this, do that, do this, and nothing will happen. <laughs> it's nothing like the military. So, you know, government is extraordinarily complex. The White House is incredibly complicated and vast. The executive um, <clears throat> branch of the government is huge and unwieldy. You've got to have somebody who can crack the whip and execute your agenda. And Jimmy Carter tried to do it for two and a half years. He managed everything from his cabinet meetings to reservations on the White House tennis court. He was a micromanager. He couldn't prioritize. And after two and a half years, he threw his hands up and said, I, give, I, I surrender. I need a White House chief. 
And his, his wife of chief, his <coughs> White House chief of staff was one of your favorite, if I recall well. Well, it took him a while. It took Jimmy Carter a while to pick the right guy. He, two and a half years in, he made Hamilton Jordan, who was his closest advisor. Hamilton Jordan was a brilliant political strategist, but he was a terrible chief of staff. He was disorganized. He practically lived out of his car. You know, he was, you know, he wore cowboy boots and he never returned phone calls to Capitol Hill. He was a disaster as White House chief of staff. The last year of his presidency, Jimmy Carter finally got it right and he picked the guy who organized his transition, Jack Watson, who was a brilliant, absolutely organized, efficient manager, former Marine. He was, he was terrific, uh, but it was too late for Jimmy Carter. So you think that the, the fact that he decided not to pick up a chief of staff uh, had a weight on <coughs> in, in yeah. his known re-election? It's in one the of these that things that's, that's unknowable. We'll never know if, if Jimmy Carter's presidency might have uh, turned out differently. He was dealt a terrible hand. Obviously, he had OPEC, and he had the hostage crisis, and he had the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah, everything that could go, go wrong went wrong. So who knows? But if, in my opinion, if he had chosen Jack Watson on day one and empowered him to really run his White House, Jimmy Carter, it might have been a different story. But just to understand how, because maybe I was impressed, maybe you are not, but because I am here, I ask. <laughs> so I loved the story of the chief of staff of Clinton bringing him, you know, like a, a, a game, you know, they did with his time, a timetable, and they showed him <coughs> how much time he was wasting, and he was like, oh my God, I'm not. So yeah. tell me about that story. Well, you know, Bill Clinton sort of made this a similar mistake. Uh, you know, like Jimmy Carter, he didn't realize that he needed an empowered White House chief to really make the trains run in the West Wing. He had his best friend, Mac McClarty, who is a brilliant guy, a lovely guy, everybody, most popular guy in Washington, but he was not great at, he couldn't really tame Bill Clinton. Um, <clears throat> the joke was that there were so many people in every meeting in the Oval Office that they'd gone from war room to dorm room. Uh, and it was just total, total chaos. So a year and a half in, um, there was a kind of intervention by Hillary Clinton and Al Gore. They knew that, that you know, Clinton desperately needed a new chief of staff. They had one guy in mind, Leon Panetta, who was the uh, OMB director, they essentially kidnapped Panetta. Panetta didn't want the job, so they kidnapped him and they flew him to Camp David and they locked him in a cabin. And he suddenly found himself in a cabin with Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Al Gore, and Tipper Gore. And he said to me, Chris, I knew this wasn't going to be a fair fight. <laughs> and when, his, when, they, when he left the cabin, he was the new White House chief of staff. He completely reorganized long-winded way of getting to your point, which is that he completely... He was called the Iron Fist in a Velvet Glove. Yeah, Robert Reich just described him to me, the Labor Secretary, as he said Leon was an iron fist inside a velvet glove. You know, he was a really popular, gregarious, uh, funny Italian guy. Um, and uh, everybody loved him, but he could, he could lower the boom when he had to. But one of the first things he did was Erskine Bowles, his deputy, who also was a terrific White House chief. Um, <clears throat> Erskine did a time and motion study on Bill Clinton. They literally followed him around and they made, they made chart, a chart of what he was doing every minute of you know, how much time in the Oval, how much time on the rope line, how much time you know, doing this and that. And then they showed it to him. They had red tabs and blue tabs and yellow tabs for foreign policy, blue tabs for domestic, this, that. And they looked at it, and Clinton looked at it and realized he was totally wasting his time. He was getting nothing done. So that, that was the kind of management efficiency that Panetta and Bowles brought to the White House. And they, frankly, I think, turned the Clinton presidency around. It was dead in the water a year and a half in, Panetta, turned it around and really made re-election possible. The, the more I hear about the chief of staff, the more I think I am perfect. So 
if you know somebody that is, make, you can say my name. I, I, I would be with the thing, blue, red. The time and motion studies, pink. you're into that. Okay. And I make pizza on the top, but <laughs> this is fantastic. So, uh, <coughs> also, I, you know, when you say fi uh, the feast, I, I don't know, maybe because I had a crush on him, but nobody knows. It's, I think about, no, first of all, let's you talk about. You had a crush on Panetta? No, 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 no. No, no, somebody else, oh, but okay. come down. First, I want to say, <laughs> the, this, this is a so, again, so important, and maybe because, it, you know, being Italian and not having anything like this in our government, it's so fascin fascinating for me uh, to see this thing. And uh, I have to go and re review all the West Wing episodes because, you know, I have <laughs> to learn more <coughs> because, you know, Madame Leo said... Leo McGarry was a good one. You see, it is, he is your favorite. He's my favorite fictional chief. Okay. I am good also to do a fictional chief of staff. Okay. Because I think they get more money. And I know you have a story about that. that I, will <coughs> I have a great story about that. So when Andy Card was George W. Bush's White House chief, he was invited to an event in downtown Washington. He was told there would be a bunch of chiefs there. So he shows up. And everybody's excited. The handlers come out and say, oh, Mr. Card, come on in. We want you're just in time to meet the chief. And Card is looking around like this. To what chief? It was John Spencer who played Leo McGarry in the West Wing. Everybody's gathered around Spencer. They bring Card in. Card introduces himself. Spencer looks at Card and says, how much do you make? And Card said, no, oh, it's 100, 150K, you know, government scale. And Spencer looked at him mystified and said, is that per episode? <laughs> yes, I want to I wanna be a chief of staff fictional. So again, if you know something, I'm good. <coughs> uh, so, but le let's go to this day. I want it so to be there. You know, I have this idea in my mind. December 5th, 2008, what happened? A lot of guys. <coughs> really extraordinary day, almost unimaginable today, given the kind of unbelievable partisan bitterness and division that we have right now. But on December 5, 2008, Josh Bolton, who was George W. Bush's outgoing White House Chief of Staff, invited all the living White House Chiefs to come to the White House and sit around a table and give advice to the incoming White House Chief, Rahm Emanuel. So 13 of the living White House Chiefs showed up from Dick Cheney, to Don Rumsfeld, Panetta, Podesta, <clears throat> all of these guys. And they sat around a table and they went around and they gave Rom their ad advice. And Ken Duberstein looked at him you know, very sternly and said, never forget that when you open your mouth, it's not you speaking, but the President of the United States, to which Rom said, Oh, shit. <laughs> <coughs> they went around and went, went to all the others. And finally, they got to Dick Cheney sitting at the end of the table. Cheney, with six weeks left as vice president under George W. Bush, you know, after the Iraq War and all of the stuff that Cheney was blamed for, Cheney looks up in Rom over his glasses and says, at all costs, Control your vice president. <laughs> <coughs> Did he succeed? <laughs> anyway, so the point, but the point is that it, it was it was it was obviously there were moments of levity, but they all of these guys who represented the entire spectrum, the, the entire ideological spectrum from Cheney to Podesta, came together uh, to give Rahm Emanuel advice on how to govern. They wanted him to succeed. This was a point where we were on the verge of a Great Depression. The auto industry was about to go belly up. Credit was frozen around the world. Two wars were mild, mired in stalemate. And these guys came together to try to, as Cheney put it, to show Rom the keys to the men's room. You know, um, it was an extraordinary meeting. Well, we have to say that the chief of staff of Obama tried the same thing with uh, Rice P previous, and right. clearly it's one of the Obama failure because it didn't <laughs> work. Uh, uh, it was successful. Don't get me started on rights. 
Um, <clears throat> they, it's true that Dennis McDonough decided to try to, uh, to, to carry on that tradition, and he invited all the White House chiefs to come and see Priebus in December of, of when was it, um, 2016. So um, 12 of them, no, I'm sorry, I forget exactly how many, nine or 10 of them came. And um, they sat around, and they all told Priebus the same thing. They said, you have to be empowered uh, to do the job. If you're not, you will not succeed. Trump will not succeed. But the truth was that almost all of them came in thinking this was mission impossible for Reince Priebus, that given the nature of Trump, who is intellectually, temperamentally, and in, in many other ways unfit for office, that <clears throat> this was, um, you know, this was a Hail Mary. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the rest is history. Priebus listened to them and he said, look, you know, they all told me I had to be in charge from A to Z. I had to be able to do this and that and the other thing. I knew that wasn't in the cards. Uh, that wasn't going to happen with Trump. Um, but it was a real mistake for Priebus to think that he could, that he could uh, be an effective White House chief without uh, being empowered. We will go back there because, of course, uh, you know, the new uh, edition of the book that is this one has also the chapter about <coughs> Trump and, uh, you know, your interview with Priebus. But uh, um, I want to go back to one of my crush that is Ram Emanuel. <laughs> As all the arrogant men, I like them. So, and he said that, you know, when uh, he knew that he had to speak like the president, he said that word, because there was a roast in Chicago before that uh, Obama was president, and Obama uh, went to roast Rahm Emanuel, and he was uh, telling, just to say which kind of guy is uh, Rahm Emanuel, and Obama was uh, roasting him, and he was telling that when uh, he was a very young guy, uh, he was working, Rahm Emanuel, he was working in a deli, and he had an accident, so he cut uh, a piece of his middle finger, and Obama, during the roast, said practically that in accident made, uh, rendered um, Ram mute. <coughs> Thereby rendering <laughs> yeah. Ram mute. Mute. And when he decided to accept the, to be the chief of staff, his brother, because it's something that ran in the family, gave him a nameplate that he had on his desk for all the two years that he was uh, chief of staff, saying, <coughs> under secretary, under secretary to go fuck yourself. <laughs> so this was Ram Emanuel that I really um, like, and I met when he was... Uh, and he was already uh, mayor of, C uh, of Chicago, and uh, but he was uncertain to become uh, Obama chief of staff. But he was picked for his character that was strong, as I guess, as I understand. But also because he was not really friend with Obama, because also the chief of staff doesn't have to be really friend with the president. It has to be trustworthy, but not friend, not best friend. And he didn't want to accept, but, but then you have to say yes or yes, sir. So he did that, and <coughs> he told you that in any other condition, he would have accepted and do uh, this again, even if you just took yeah. the worst. Yeah. Of he didn't, Ram didn't want the job. He was in line to become the first uh, Jewish Speaker of the House. He was, that was his, his goal, that was his life's ambition. Um, and so, but but as he as he put it to me, when the president asks you to be chief of staff, you have two answers: yes or yes, sir. Uh, and he agreed to take the job. And I think that um, there's a story I tell in the book about about Obama before he was elected. Um, he called a secret meeting in a in a Reno, Nevada hotel room. He didn't want anybody to think that he was measuring the drapes before he'd won the election. But he called together all of Clinton's White House chiefs, they've all flew in. One or two were on speakerphone, but most of them were there. And he asked them, okay, who should my chief of staff be? First of all, do any of, any of you want to volunteer? And, and nobody did. Uh, they'd all done it before. Um, <clears throat> and Erskine Bowles looked at Obama and he said, leave your Chicago friends at home. They will only cause you grief. 
Well, oh, Obama wound up picking Emmanuel. He wasn't a close friend, and that can be a problem. Uh, Mac McClarty was probably a little bit too close a friend to Jimmy Carter, I mean to Bill Clinton. Um, Ham Jordan was too close to Jimmy Carter to be effective. Um, Rom knew Obama, they knew each other, but they weren't that close. And, and I think Obama, at that moment of crisis that I described before, what he really needed right out of the gates was somebody who could get stuff done, who could really get bills passed on Capitol Hill. And Rahm was a guy who famously took the hill. Um, you know, he would do whatever it took. And um, you may remember <clears throat> the famous story about um, some pollster that was, Rahm was unhappy with, and Rahm sent a package to this pollster that was wound up on his on on the steps of his uh, on his doorstep, and when he opened it, it was a dead fish, right? Um, <coughs> Rom did not <laughs> mince words or take prisoners, and he got stuff done, and he got a stimulus bill passed, uh, he got a health care bill passed, however messy in the process, he got a lot of stuff done. But what about because I remember that that. that at that time, there was a lot of rumors about the fact that he didn't get along. He didn't get along with Valerie Jarrett. Nobody think, seems to get along with Valerie Jarrett. I don't know why. You will tell me. And uh, But that also he was not really getting along with Michelle Obama because he was holding the health care, but uh, Michelle wanted that that. Uh, yeah. that Barack was going with the health care reform. Is that true? And because then we will mention another first lady, uh, <coughs> Melania, uh, how important is also the first lady in all this? Just yeah. to switch for, from the boys one moment. Depends, depends on the first lady. Uh, Nancy Reagan and Hillary Clinton were real powers to be reckoned with. I mean, they were, they were real forces in those White House. Michelle, not so much in terms of policy. I don't think Michelle Obama. Valerie Jarrett gets a bad rap. Um, I think that Valerie was not really, like VJ, they called her. VJ was more of a cheerleader for Obama than she was somebody who put her finger on the scale or tried to push for one bill or another. Or um, Dennis McDonough, told me that um, she was somebody who was always, you know, cheering Obama on, enthusiastic about whatever he wanted to do. But I think, so I think some of that friction was overstated, but, but there were fights, and, and there was, you know, Rahm and Obama really fought it out over health care. Uh, Rahm Emanuel had been burned by his experience in the Clinton White House with Hillary Clinton and her ill-fated uh, health care bill. And so he, he didn't want to be burned again. He wanted to go with a more modest proposal. The Titanic. What was <laughs> the Titanic? Yeah. So he wanted to go with a, a scaled down version of the health care bill, and Obama fought him. And the way, Ob the way Rom put it to me was you show me a White House that doesn't have white hats and black hats fighting it out, battling for the soul of the presidency, and I'll show you a White House. It isn't getting anything done. But at the end of the day, when Obama made a decision, Rahm would salute and go off and execute it. And he did that on health care, came in to the Oval during his son's bar mitzvah to make phone calls and pass that bill. So I think that, um, you know, it was, a, you know it, was, it, was, it was messy, but I think they were pretty effective. And now, you know, I think that uh, some way you told us already, but uh, I find out that there is in any White House, uh, and again, I am studying also so I can be effective, that there, are, there is always this fight between the true believers and the people that knows how to govern. So, <coughs> and uh, especially in the Obama uh, administration, uh, there was this group of people that were called uh, the Chicago Mafia, and so another connection with uh, Italy some way. So, <laughs> but there were no bombing <coughs> or stuff like that. But why the Chicago Mafia and uh, who are the, tr the true believers? Well, and why they are a pain a in the neck? Overlap, actually. I mean, I think the Chicago Mafia was, was really Valerie VJ 
and Axelrod. Um, and there were a lot of true believers like John Favreau and the, the younger, the kids, as Bill Daly would call them, in the White House. Um, so there's always some friction there. And I think some people thought that Rom was, you know, there was a real divide between the, the really idealistic Obama uh, staffers, the young staffers, and the Clinton old guard. And to some extent, Rahm was considered old guard. Bill Day Daly was really old guard when he came in and replaced Rahm Emanuel. Um, he had a terrible year. He just couldn't, he was just really behind the curve. Uh, everybody thought he was uh, a dinosaur from the Clinton era. So that was a problem. <clears throat> um, but um, every White House has those factions, and the most famous White House for that, and the most effective chief at dealing with it was probably the Reagan White House and Jim Baker. Uh, those of you who have read the book know that Jim Baker, I consider the gold standard, the guy who was the best, uh, the, uh, the guy who really wrote the book. And his White House, the Reagan White House, was just a, you know, it was a melee. It was a, a circular firing squad. You had, <clears throat> um, you had the true believers, and then you had the pragmatists, and Reagan was, um, Baker was the so-called hated pragmatist, and all the people, all the true believers were saying, let Reagan be Reagan, and you know, you're, you're, you're preventing us from, from carrying out the Reagan revolution. Well, guess what? It turned out that Reagan was the biggest pragmatist of all. Uh, Reagan would always take a compromise. He'd, you know, he'd take 60% of what he was trying to get and come back for more. So Baker was savvy enough to make alliances with Nancy, most importantly, Nancy Reagan, who was famously the personnel director of that White House. Michael Deaver, who was a deputy chief, uh, he, you may, some of you may be old enough to remember Deaver was the maestro of all of uh, Reagan's public appearances, who he arranged the flags and he, um, he made sure that um, Reagan's message was, was seen and heard. Deaver was like a son to Reagan and Nancy, and Baker knew it, and so he made him an ally. So when the hard right ideologues came after him, Baker prevailed. He could always, he could always count on Nancy and Deaver, and um, he, made, he made the White House. Um, he, without Jim Baker, I think there would have been no Reagan revolution, so-called. But it's a no-girl place. Again, we never had a women president. We went very close. And we never had a chief of staff, a woman chief of staff. But we... But Obama went very close to this, to pick up a woman. Why he didn't change his opinion? Just because he was a woman, or you know that was the main reason, you think? Or really because she was not a good fit? I think Obama was, a, was somebody who was comfortable around strong women. Um, Susan Rice, others, um, he didn't have a problem with that. Other presidents did. And I think Obama was open to the idea of a female chief of staff. And I think when, when Dennis McDonough was up for the job as the fourth White House chief, uh, there was a woman named Nancy Ann DeParle, De, excuse me, and Nancy Ann DeParle, who was um, essentially the brains behind Obamacare. Uh, she was um, she she was the one who really put it together. I think in the end, she was a policy person but she didn't know Capitol Hill. Um, she wasn't a political person. And I think Dennis McDonough, who'd worked on the Hill for Tom Daschle for years and really knew politics as well as policy, I think, I think that's why he won out. I think that's why he got the job. But she came close. So maybe the next president will, this one won't have, but you know. Well, there's Ivanka. She, you know. Okay. so. And about that, we were talking about the fact that the chief of staff is the one that organized the life, pushed the agenda, and uh, you know <coughs> has the trust of the president and is able to say no. But uh, Trump clearly doesn't have anything of that. You know, there is the uh, 
they are not even able to tell the president that he doesn't have to tweet. So yeah. in a, in a <coughs> pr previous tell you about the many if, uh, attempt that they made to take off the, to steal the phone, but only once Miss Melania, Miss uh, First Lady Melania, was able to say, no tweeting. And he didn't tweet for two days. He stopped for a couple of days. <laughs> Trump, Trump has no idea and has not learned anything about governing in his first year and three or four months or whatever it's been. And he's not the first president. He's, he's, he's singular. He's unique. But he's not the first president to come into office full of hubris, thinking he's the smartest guy in the room, intoxicated by his political victory. Most other presidents get over it. Most other presidents figure out after a while, that, as Jimmy Carter did, as Bill Clinton did, um, as um, you know, other presidents have, that you cannot govern without help. You cannot govern without an empowered White House chief of staff. I mean, in a normal functioning White House, everything flows from the president through a White House chief who, I mean, I haven't really defined everything he does, but he's not only the gatekeeper, he's in charge of communications, making sure that everybody's on the same page. This is in a normal White House. He's, um, he's the flak catcher who takes all the grief. Um, he's the honest broker of information who makes sure that only the toughest decisions get into the Oval Office and, and that they're teed up with information on every side. Um, he executes the president's agenda, and at the end of the day, most importantly, can walk into the Oval Office the way Jim Baker could or Leon Panetta could, close the door and tell the president what he doesn't want to hear. Um, <clears throat> so it's, um, it's a big job, and I've forgotten what the question was. But that, uh, that is a, it's a, wh why do you think that it's really so difficult for the Trump administration to have not even Ivanka. I mean, it's clear how much, uh, how much, how big is the influence that Ivanka has on Donald Trump, or how much he uh, want to push his daughter. But uh, nobody is really able to, you know, um, Trump change him a little bit. Trump is ignorant of. This is someone who does not read. This is someone who has absolutely you think no, didn't read your book? <laughs> no knowledge of history, no clue beyond his, um, his small world of the 26th floor of Trump Tower. You cannot run the White House the way you run the 26th floor of Trump Tower with people coming and going and nobody empowered to execute your agenda. It does not work. Every other president has learned that lesson. Trump has not. He's a slow learner. But what amazed me is that in your conversation with the previous, uh, clearly he was fi he, he has been fired and he was talking to you and he, he was talking about that is crazy you know just the day after the inauguration a couple of days after or the same day I don't remember but there was a lot of issue and he went to the White House and everybody was freaking out because the president was crazy, uh, you know, was angry about the report of the press about the inauguration and the number of the inauguration and the picture of the inauguration. And everybody was in charge in that moment uh, trying to think how to show that was fake news and that he had more people and the previous tried to, to uh, talk to him. But what impressed me is that even now, or recently, he told you, well, there were a lot of people that were not able to come, like saying, yes, it's still important that there were more people that at the Obama inauguration. <coughs> I still think that. What's wrong well, with that? You know, it may not have been the biggest inauguration. It was the one most attended by friends of Vladimir Putin. <laughs> uh, as, we, as we learned recently, um, this, you know, this comical, you know, almost comic book character, Russian oligarch that they pulled off a plane and interviewed, and it turned out he'd been at the inauguration. Anyway, um, it's true that Priebus tried to talk Trump off the ledge. When it was the morning of January 21st, Priebus was at home watching cable news. It was a little after 6 a.m. The phone 
went off. It was Trump screaming at Priebus, um, you know, furious, livid, uh, saying, do something about this. Fix this story about the inaugural photos. And, um, and Priebus tried to talk him out of, tried to talk him off the ledge, said, look, nobody cares. They're more Demo this is a democratic area. You know, there are more Democrats in, you know, there's 65% Democratic in Maryland. And he was reeling off figures and trying to talk Trump out of it. But a few hours later, Sean Spicer stepped up to the podium and told that flagrant lie. It was not Melissa McCartney? <laughs> <laughs> well, I miss Melissa McCarthy, don't you? She yeah, I know. Um, so, you know, truth was the first casualty on the first day. And that's not just on Trump, that's on Priebus. Uh, Priebus never should have been complicit in that. No previous chief of staff I can think of would have. Uh, Priebus decided to go along to get along. And that was, you know, he became the sycophant in chief. Um, <clears throat> why he would talk to me after I've been saying that about him on MSNBC for six months, I have no idea, but he did. Yeah, it's really hard to understand his mind, how he works then. So it's not just me. But uh, talking about, we mentioned Melissa McCartney that we love. And um, so <coughs> we miss kind a little bit Sean Spicer for that because she's not playing. It's harder to play. What is the other name of the? I know. <laughs> 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 I was pretending. Uh, I was saying the mascara thing. Uh, so about Sarah's, yeah. I mean, how do you? What do you think about also? You know, everything is different, but also every president was going to the correspondent dinner and the diner and the dinner, diner, whatever, and the, they were. Uh, accepting clearly the First Amendment and the, the freedom of speech. Why uh, do you think that uh, uh, Donald Trump is really fighting these things like he could win? I think he's not going to win on this. I mean, uh, the freedom of speech. <coughs> and why everybody's really sensitive? I mean, Michelle Wolf didn't offend Sarah Sanders. She made a joke that was, uh, you know, the president offended people with special need, people many times, but... Uh, um, she was, she was blessed. She she was, you know, like a lot of people. Oh my God, she was too mean. She was too mean. She was not mean. She was making a joke, and was not about the appearance. Why he is doing something that is not, that is so anti-American, and so many Americans are buying that. What do you think? As a as a foreign, yeah. I noticed <clears throat> that. Yeah, I, I mean, I I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually about to give a commencement address at my prep school, um, and I was, I was, you know, and, and and I'm planning to, to make the point that, you know, imagine, uh, imagine a president, who runs the White House like a crime family, um, <clears throat> with no regard for constitutional norms or democratic institutions, who believes that every critic is an enemy. Of, of America. And I was going to say, but enough about Richard Nixon. Uh, <laughs> you know, th this was true, and I remember when I was graduating in 1971, I remember Spiro Agnew famously saying that the press corps is a bunch, an effete corps of impudent snobs. Uh, and so this all began back with Nixon, but Trump has taken it well beyond the levels that Nixon, Nixon never said this stuff out loud, even though Agnew said some of it. Nixon um, might have had, he, he might have um, sicked the CIA on the FBI to obstruct the investigation of Watergate, but he did it privately. He had hauled him and do it uh, privately. Trump does it unabashedly. <clears throat> so I don't know how, I, you know, I don't, my opinion about Trump isn't any more informed than anybody else's. Um, but, you know, this is something we've never seen before. Is it narcissism? Is it um, authoritarianism? Is it all of the above? I don't know. But um, then we will, you will be able to do some question. Uh, but um, you, you define Trump uh, on CNN, I guess, the Death Star. 
a death star. <coughs> I called him a death star. I, and uh, uh, today, just f 20 minutes. Uh, 20 minutes before to start, I got the news that Michael Cohen's partner accept, accepted a deal uh, that is not good, I think, for Trump and his entourage. So it's more that star. Why did you say is it that star? And uh, do you still think that? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing worse than lying um, morning, noon, and night uh, when you're in the White House, you know, other White Houses. You know, spinning is what most White Houses do. Lying is what this White House does on a daily basis, uh, beginning with the president and going on down. But the only thing worse than lying the way this White House does is um, acquiescing in it, going along with it. And I think that's happened to a lot of this Republican Congress. And 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 my point about the di what I what I said was that. Everyone within the orbit of this Death Star known as Donald Trump is sucked in and tarnished or destroyed. And I think that's happened to almost everyone in Trump's circle, inner circle, um, with, few, with very few exceptions. And I think it's happening to John Kelly. And by the way, you know, Steve Bannon disappeared, but he went to Italy to support the Lega party that won the election and is going to make... <coughs> It's going to go with the other populist party that is uh, the M5 star. And uh, so they are spreading their view outside. So, But uh, before to leave uh, time for some question, I want to close on a you know, lighter note with uh, some uh, private <laughs> No, first of all, I know that you, you're <coughs> doing the book you're and... Talking about Don Lemon now and... Yeah, Ava Ava and about and the Avenatti boys and, and, and Michael and your, Avenatti. Your because when we say basta, we have to say who created the <coughs> hashtag basta, you know, that is Michael Avenatti. <coughs> but you know, I am a girl, let me do my job. So, but before <laughs> that, let's talk about another fabulous girl that is your wife, Carrie, that helped you a lot in the making of the book. But so I especially, I want to hear about that fabulous anecdote about somebody that you couldn't find. Yeah, so what happened <laughs> was, um, when I began the book, I, ha I had left ABC News. I'd been there for years. Uh, but all of a sudden, I was on my own, um, trying to make films and trying to write this book. and. I suddenly thought, you know, how do you, where do I begin? How do I find Dick Cheney's home address? And so Carrie, my beautiful wife Carrie, went off and she went online. She came back an, an hour or two later and she said, I've got it. And I said, got what? She said, Dick Cheney's home address. And I said, where'd you get it? She said, warcriminals.org. <laughs> So that was the first big research breakthrough uh, for the book. And from there on, it was off to the races. OK. Let's go back to the most interesting and juicy part. Okay. Is Michael Cohen so, so uh, Comey, sorry. Is Comey Jim Comey. Jim Co uh, sorry. I was thinking about Avenatti again. Uh, <laughs> is Comey really so tall? This is a very he's, important he's, question. He's gigantic. Have you seen? I he's, saw your picture together. You saw together. my picture of me with him. He's six foot eight, and I felt like a, a dwarf next to him. He's, um, we actually, uh, you know, I, I don't really have any great inside, inside stuff on Comey, but we wound up talking about our sons when I met him at, this, at his book party. My son was in his son's class at Kenyon, and so we were sharing stories about our sons, and, and he told me that his son, who is also six eight, and was a star on the Kenyan basketball team. He said he's now the only philosophy major who's studying to become a cop <laughs> in Arlington, Virginia. So we were trading stories about our kids. But do you still think that he had a big responsibility in uh, it's part of the reason, the many reasons, Russia, uh, you know, don't forget the, uh, the difficulty to register to vote that we are having, uh, but many, many reasons, Me, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, Wisconsin, but he's, he was a part of the failing think, of Hillary Clinton. I think Comey made plenty of mistakes, and I, you know, I don't know how everybody else feels, but I, I personally don't really buy 
his explanation for the second Hillary announcement, the reopening the investigation. Um, I don't, I still don't buy that. But I got to say that when it comes down to, you know, when Rudy Giuliani said the other day that we want this to be about Comey's credibility versus Trump's and we win that. <laughs> I thought, on what planet? You know, I mean, Trump is, as Michael Wolff put it, you know, he's the least credible person on the face of the earth. So how do you win that battle with Comey? I don't, I don't think you do. And last but not least, you know, he's as arrogant as Rahm Emanuel, so I really like him. Mm, Avenatti. Avenatti? Yes. It's the Italian <coughs> Avenatti, we will say. You say Avenatti, that can't sign different, but it's Michael Avenatti. Let me tell you, Avenatti and I, we, we are like this. <laughs> okay, so I, now you know the only reason why I am here, because <laughs> I want to be a chief of staff, or I want to work with Chris and Michael Avenatti. Let me just tell you that my feelings were really hurt when I heard that Avenatti and Scaramucci were pitching a show together. Did anybody, did anybody see that? So, 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 you know, I want David Chidical to pitch a show with me and Avenatti. We're going to kill that other show. But, um, and I'm going to go there and cook pizza with the guys. So, okay. He's actually, in the green room, he's a very normal, personable guy. And, you know, I, I can say it's a lot of fun to be in a green room with... Michael Avenatti, Malcolm Nance, John Alter, and David Korn, which I was the other day, nobody can get a word in when Malcolm starts talking, is all I can say. <laughs> and, and then you go and you sit with Don Lemon. I mean, what a tragic life, yeah? Anyway, but what do you think about... I'm done with Don, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I'm about to do a deal with MSNBC, so I may not see Don for a while. Okay, Alas, you will I see my that. friend Stephanie Rule then. I hope so. Yeah. Because she is she is uh, amazing, yeah. by the way, and uh, I am uh, on. A and so is Nicole Wallace. I love her. Yeah, women power. And Katie, Katie Tour. And Joey, a lot, a lot, a lot of women. But uh, wh what do you think about Michael Avenatti being <coughs> always on TV? Do you think that this strategy is working, or is it really because he wants to become famous? And let me, well, let me just say, I'm really hoping that Avenatti is, is not too good to be true. Let's just hope that, because he certainly loves the camera. Um, and so far, I think, Everything he said has, has been borne out. Um, I'm just hoping that that yes, remains, the, remains the case. Okay. He needs a chief of staff, maybe. <laughs> he might. He might. Okay. <laughs> so do you have any question? Uh, my time is done. I wanted to talk only about Michael Avenanti, but I hope <laughs> that and get <coughs> a job with these two guys because they are fantastic. And um, do you have any question? I am sure there are many. <clears throat> Hi. So this isn't a question, but in, on the lighter side of what you've been talking about, we've heard so many funny stories about inside stuff with Chris. And there was one he told me, I don't think was in a book anywhere, but one of the things is that my last name and Cheney's last name are very similar. And half the time he's calling up going, oh my God, I butt dialed Cheney again, trying to hit, <laughs> think he was hitting me. So one day he told me a story. He butted out Cheney and got him on the phone. And if you don't mind, I don't know if you want to tell, but at the Dairy Queen story, I mean, that, <laughs> that is a classic. I think these people would love that. So it was actually the weekend before the election. <clears throat> and the, and I, I dialed Cheney by mistake. And he, he picked up and he said, hello. And I said, oh, Mr. Vice President, it's Chris Whipple. He goes, hey, Chris, what's happening? And I said, I said where are you? And he said, I'm at a McDonald's in Laramie, Wyoming. <laughs> and I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I used to be in charge of things. Now I'm the chauffeur. <clears throat> he was driving his daughter around who was running for Congress. So um, anyway, we had a little chat. And I said, sorry, I won't butt dial you again. And that was it.
thanks to Kerry, yeah. warcriminals.org, if anybody who needs it. But do you have my number on your phone just in case the boys want? I need, I need it. I need oh, your phone. Okay. Hi, um, I'm interested in psychology, especially of how, why people do things the way they do. And my question is, what makes people vote or favor those who are clearly not suitable to lead? <clears throat> wow, that's way above my pay grade. But, um, you know, we're, we've, we've reached a point in this country where everything has be, just become, seems to me, has become so tribal that uh, many of Trump's voters, um, you, you would probably be way better educated and equipped to answer this than I am, but I think that, I think that many voters s simply don't care necessarily about holding Trump to some standard of truth that we all would have expected of any previous candidate because they're they're voting tribally you know they're voting for this is somebody who uh, is putting you know their the elite in their place or you know whatever the motivation might be um, they feel that they they wanted a wrecking ball in Washington and it's exactly what they've got um, <clears throat> but I'm not a Psychologist, so I'd, I'd just be my guess would be no better than yours. Hey, Chris, was it was it easy to get these people to talk to you, or did some of them um, give you a hard time, or were they colorful in, in their interview? It was. Um, it got easier as things went along. You know, the, the, we started with, not with Cheney, as it turned out, but with Rumsfeld. He was the first interview. I did a documentary uh, called The President's Gatekeepers. So this book really began back in 2011 um, with that big research breakthrough. And then we got Rumsfeld in the chair. And then we got Cheney in the chair. And one thing led to another. And ultimately, we got some Democrats and they all talked among themselves, and so they must have said, well, you know, it's, he's harmless, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and so one thing led to one interview, led to another, led to another, led to another, and we just were dumb enough, um, I, naive enough to think we'd get every living White House chief. And at the end of the day, we did. Um, some of them were much more guarded than others. Erskine Bowles, oddly enough, was a really tough one to reel in. I happen to know somebody, a college roommate, who knew him uh, well. Uh, he was on the, uh, the board at Morgan Stanley, <clears throat> and he just happened to know Erskine and talked, talked him into sitting down with me. Um, some, there were some things they didn't want to talk about. Um, Bowles didn't want to talk about Monica. He couldn't go there. He was so... You know, he literally, I tell the story in the book about how during one meeting, uh, he literally just got sick and, and ran out of the room. Uh, he was that offended by Clinton's behavior and couldn't deal with it. So he wouldn't touch that subject. Um, that was true for all of them in some, in some ways. There were some things they wouldn't talk about. And of course, sitting White House chiefs are, are pretty uh, guarded, but McDonough was was pretty candid, I thought, the last time I sat down with him. Uh, we joke about it now. He said, I was really cranky that day. He was, <laughs> he was, he was going after Panetta and everybody who criticized him. And, um, it was a great experience. It was really, um, really a highlight of my career. Oh, okay. Um, I was curious, because I had a perception when I came here that the uh, chief of staff was someone who would uh, say no. You know, that's what his job was. And you alluded to various, job, yeah. various traits of uh, various uh, chiefs of staff. Some have been good at it and failed, and uh, others have done that. And you said the gold standard with uh, Jim Baker. So my question is, if you were to write a job description 
of what it takes to be a very effective one. It's not just saying no, it's setting up alliances, but you can still fail by doing that. Or being aloof, you can fail by doing that. Or being too friendly, you can fail by doing that. What would be your job description <coughs> having talked to all these uh, I gentlemen? Think the, the, the short answer would be be like Jim Baker or Leon Panetta. And what I mean and what I mean by that is those were guys who were, you know, temperament is one of the one of the unsung attributes that's really important. These were two guys who were grounded, they were comfortable in their own skin. Jim Baker was a 50-year-old, smooth as silk, Texas lawyer who had nothing to prove. And he could walk into the Oval Office, close the door, and tell Reagan what he didn't want to hear. You know, Reagan, <clears throat> right out of the blocks, he wanted to tackle Social Security reform. And Baker went in and said, Mr. President, Social Security reform is the third rail of American politics. You touch it, you'll be electrocuted. Um, I suggest we try something else. And he, with help from Nancy and others, he brought Reagan around to the economy, <clears throat> tax cuts, and the rest is history. Leon Panetta could do that with, uh, with Bill Clinton. He'd been a congressman. He knew it helps to know Capitol Hill and to know the White House. Both of those guys did, but at the end of the day, they were, they were, they were guys who were comfortable in their own skin um, in a way that Reince Priebus and John Kelly and Don Regan and a bunch of others were not. And I think, so that's, that's a big part of the job description. So they, I just would add to that based on what you said. So they had an ability to know how to say what they needed to say to be accepted by the him or that too, yeah. Communication yeah, that too. And look, it may be with Donald Trump, that may be mission impossible. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I would know exactly how to be Ronald Reagan's White House chief. Uh, but I can tell you who's, who, who hasn't been, and both Priebus and Kelly have failed. And I think in some ways, I think Kelly, Priebus was a sycophant. Kelly, um, in some ways, I think his failure is the greater failure in the sense that uh, Trump really did give him more authority and empowered him in a way that Priebus never had been. And yet, I think Kelly has failed. Uh, he's failed to tell Trump hard truths. And, um, you know, right now, he should be in the Oval Office with the door closed telling Trump, look, this, this meeting you want to have, you want me to have this meeting with the Department of Justice and Rosenstein, and, and you want me to out a confidential informant for Congress? No, we're not going to do that. And here's why. You cannot go down this road for the following reasons. It's, it's going to be Article C, D, and E in the obstruction of justice case against you for openers. And <clears throat> you have to be able to, and, and look, easy for me to say, but I think that Trump weirdly would respect that more than having a sycophant just say, yes, boss, what a blessing it is to be here. You seem to be suggesting that there's a certain moral deliquescence <laughs> in in uh, Kelly's tenure as chief of staff. Jim Baker would say, "Your words, not mine." <laughs> <laughs> right, but um, at a certain point, and I, I mean, so many people thought when he was appointed that, as a general, he would bring discipline <clears throat> and all of that, yeah. and then there were points when I began to say, maybe he was really a bad guy all along and we just didn't know it. We were falsely reassured. So that rather than moral deliquescence, he was sort of chosen for his corruption uh, that just was not immediately visible. It's a theory. Yeah. And I just like your thoughts on that. Well, I, I think there's no question that Kelly um, you know, there were these huge, unrealistic expectations about Kelly that he would be the grown-up in the room. 
he'd be the moderating force that would somehow take the rough edges off this crude character, Donald Trump. <clears throat> and he hasn't been that. And he's probably much, much more of a hardliner ideologically than anybody really realized at first. Um, but I think there's also one of the problems may be that four-star generals are accustomed to saluting the commander-in-chief. And that's not what you want in a White House chief of staff. I mean, yes, when the decision is finally made, you want to carry it out. You have to execute it. Um, but I think that, that may be one of the problems as well. And there are people who say that Kelly is not the guy he used to be, that he's changed. Um, you know, some of the there's some of the Marines who who served with him say we don't recognize this guy, and whether that was Trump, uh, whether it was there are a lot of theories. There are no more questions. I think since we started with this question, uh, is there an equivalent in Italy of the? Uh, chief of Staff, and Angela and I had a con very long conversation about this. Well, the, the, to make it, well, it's a, it's a complicated answer. I try to keep it very brief, but just to give you an idea, um, the White House employs about 400 people, roughly. Uh, the Quirinale Palace, that is the residence of the Italian President of the Republic, employs about 800 people. And the President of the Italian Republic, as many of you probably know, is not the chief of the executive. He's a more of a representative of national unity. Uh, Palazzo Chigi, that is the home to the Prime Minister of Italy, chief of the executive, employs about 4,000 people. If you don't count, there are about 3,000 other employees that are either consultants hired on a permanent basis or borrowed from other ministries. So already there, you, you know, the, the numbers are enormous if you think that Italy is about 57, 58 million people in the United States. OK, so that's the proportions already. Um, and then, of course, the, 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 the presidents of the Republic, again, is more like ceremonial and symbolic. And there isn't really an equivalent uh, of, the, uh, of the chief of staff. Probably the figure that goes closer, and Andrea Fiano here, who is a, a senior journalist uh, of the Italian uh, press corps here in New York, might correct me if I'm wrong, would be the undersecretary for the Presidenza del Consiglio, that really gets the ball rolling of the agenda of the prime minister. And in the past, it depends on there on, on, on whoever is chosen by the prime minister. Um, you had some of them that went on and did their own careers and. One famous one is uh, Andreotti, Giulio Andreotti, who was a very young undersecretary to the prime minister that at that time was uh, Alcide de Gasperi. And then he went on uh, with a brilliant, and if discussed, very, very discussed political career of his own. And uh, they used to say that in the morning, both Andreotti and his chief, Prime Minister de Gasperi, and we're talking about the mid 40s to the 50s, they would go to mass every day daily mass. The only difference was that the Gasperi would talk to God and Andreotti would talk to the priest. And I think that gives us some sort of an idea of what the Italian chief equivalent of the chief of staff would do. And uh, Andrea, do you have any anything to add to this? Andrea Fiano is the uh, editor-in-chief of Global Finance. Define in a different way, probably less formal. I don't know if they run the day by day things, but and it's funny that you brought up these numbers, these astronomical numbers, how many they they employ. At the end of the day, is a game for very few people. Probably, I find there are more people involved in the White House than the Palazzo Chigi, or but not in the payroll. <laughs> the payroll, yes, but I mean, if we if you look at the current yeah. selection of a prime minister, whether he was or not, I know you. That's another story, but. There certainly, 
is, uh, there are advisors to the current Italian president who have a very important role, but they are advisor. I don't think they can be the finest chief of staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. And with this final political comparison, I thank again Chris Ripple very much for having written the book and for having shared his thoughts with Angela Vitaliano and with all of us tonight here at the Casa. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Chris.